Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, January 16th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, of course, we do have yet another crypto miner out and about. This one distinguishes itself by being written in Ruby. Now, I guess no language is obscure enough to have a crypto miner written in it. I'm waiting for the Haskell one. And in the case of Ruby, of course, it does include a Ruby on Rails vulnerability that it's trying to exploit in addition to PHP and other vulnerabilities. Now, looking at a lot of these attacks over the last couple of weeks, uh, one thing I actually found kind of odd or interesting was that I don't believe there are actually a lot of different individuals launching these attacks. I do see a lot of the same source addresses, a lot of the same sort of basic techniques being used, even though they are very noisy. They're looking at a wide range of web application vulnerabilities. They do appear to all sort of originate from a very small number of actual sources. And as a note about this, internetresearch.is is a domain that is used by this recent Ruby miner. I think I've also seen it in other miners uh, last week, but have to dig through my notes. Sounds very innocent, but appears to be a 100% malicious domain. All it does is it forwards you to whatever website is currently being used to distribute the malicious code. So don't go there, but keep that domain in mind that it's probably something that you want to look out for or probably just outright block. And one of the big controversies around the meltdown patches was how much they will impact CPU performance. And now, of course, we all knew that this would very much depend on the workload, but we now got some pretty good hard numbers from SolarWinds. SolarWinds measured across the AWS cloud how it was impacted by these patches. And they saw initially a quite substantial impact, sort of off the order from 50% CPU utilizations, the systems went up to 75% CPU utilization. So essentially 25% of the CPU usage was due to these patches. However, and they just published an update to this late last week, they are now seeing again some performance improvement on these systems and they appear to be turning back to some of their pre-patch levels. What appears to be happening here is that there's a second generation of these patches being rolled out that does affect performance less. So at least that's uh, SolarWinds guess on uh, this particular effect. We'll have to see how this uh, works out uh, for the rest of us. And Seagate released new firmware for its personal cloud drives. That new firmware did quietly patch to cross-site request forgery flaws. Now, cross-site request forgery, this is not usually directly exploitable by connecting to the drive. You need to actually trick a user that's authenticated to the drive to actually send the exploit to that uh, the web application here. But in this particular case, if the attacker managed to do that, the attacker actually was able to then execute arbitrary commands on the drive. So exploitation is a little bit tricky, but still very possible. And with devices like this, uh, we have seen this often being exploited, for example, by DNS changers that will change DNS settings in firewalls that are accessible from inside a network and don't require authentication or require default passwords. So there's certainly something that you should patch quickly before someone releases an exploit and it shows up on various random sites. Seagate knew about this flaw back in October, hasn't acknowledged any communication from the researcher disclosing it, but evidently they now got around to releasing an update without actually pointing out that they fixed this very important or critical flaw. And then we got another critical vulnerability, this time in Shibboleth. Shibboleth, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of a federated identity system. It's pretty popular in particular in the EDU realm. 
it's all open source and it also understands SAML. Well, the problem here is it apparently doesn't properly sanitize SAML parameters. With that, some of these parameters can be truncated. So essentially an attacker is able to have one message signed by Shibboleth and then actually present another message with these truncated parameters in order to gain access to resources that the attacker should not have access to. Proof of concept exploits have been released and if you're looking at the XML, yes, it's complex, but not really all that difficult to pull off for someone that understands a little bit about how Shibboleth works. Well, uh, that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.